Okay, so today I want to go over the idea of motif. Motif is a literary element that's going to come up a lot in Romeo and Juliet, and so it's one that you need to know. But before I go over motif, you need to understand symbolism. Obviously, symbolism is something that's probably at this point you know very well. Um, you know that to use a symbol in a story, if author uses a symbol in a story, that it's using an object to really represent something else. Right? We have symbols in our everyday life, so I think we're all familiar with symbolism. Um, we know that even as children, that the feather that Dumbo holds in his trunk is a symbol for his bravery, for his um, ability to take risks and to try something and overcome his obstacles. We know that he doesn't really need the feather to fly. It's not magical, but it is a symbol for him. We know that when we watch Toy Story, Andy's signature at the bottom of Woody's foot is symbolic of Woody's love for Andy and for um, for all the toys, really, their love for their children, right? And of course, in Toy Story 2, when Andy's name is painted over um, by kind of the bad guy in the movie, Woody is really upset because it is, it's symbolic that he's no longer Andy's toy, right? He needs the signature there. And in fact, at the end of Toy Story 2, he gets the, he writes the signature back on the foot because he wants it to represent um, being part of Andy's life again. Uh, when you watch Snow White or you read the story of Snow White, she's always described as having skin the color of snow, right? The, the pureness of her skin, the whiteness of her skin. White always represents purity, right? She is pure. She hasn't been corrupted in any way like the evil queen. They always describe her lips and cheeks as being rosy to demonstrate her youth and her beauty, again, something that the queen doesn't have. And her hair is as black as coal, which is an odd choice considering her rosy cheeks and lips and her fair skin, but black as coal could symbolize death. And we do know that when she eats that apple, she's going to die, right? So, um, and yes, the prince will bring her back to life with a kiss, but she still does die with the apple. And that apple, that apple also is symbolic, right? We know apple, um, the story of the apple connected back to um, a Bible story in Genesis, and we have the, you know, the apple from Adam and Eve. And so apples are symbolic, and especially this apple, she's tempted by the evil queen who's disguised as the old woman. And she doesn't want to eat the apple, but she doesn't want to feel rude, just shows her kindness again, and her, um, her want to please others. So this apple is not just an apple, it's definitely symbolic. But what if we were reading Snow White? And we kept seeing apples everywhere. Apples were not just at the end of the story, but throughout the entire story, over and over and over again. Well, that is a motif, okay? A motif is an element that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And a lot of times a symbolic element that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And through repeating it as an audience member in a play or a reader or a viewer, we are supposed to then start paying attention to this symbolic element and we're supposed to realize that there's got to be some significance behind it. A lot of times it points to the mood. Um, it's supposed to make us feel a certain way, but uh, often it also points to the theme and it's supposed to um, kind of drive home the lesson. So for example, in Frozen, there is a motif of doors. We have characters who are constantly closing doors and windows and refusing to let anybody in. Right, we even have um, eventually the doors separate the sisters. Right, there we go, Elsa closing the door. And of course we get the, do you wanna build a snowman song where we have Anna constantly knocking on the door for her sister, right? We have that whole, here we go, peering under the door. Here she is again, even as she gets older. Here we go, we got the door blocking Elsa from being able to go outside. We have them shutting up the doors here. Here we go, Anna's older now. Again, a door separates her and her sister. But it's not just in the beginning of the movie. If we also, um, there we go, we have the girls opening up the doors to, um, to all the inhabitants from the other cities and the other countries. And so they're finally opening up the doors, hopefully letting some people in. Um, and, you know, obviously, the idea of doors continuing to be closed or open 
there's a reason, right? If you're watching the movie and you keep seeing We see characters opening doors, right? She right saying here, even this song is love is an open door. We even have the this you know, word door in the song. Right? And we even have there we go. But it's again, it's not just in the beginning of the movie. Um, here we got Elsa. She's finally kind of come to grips with who she is. She's accepting herself. And what does she do after singing her song? She goes inside her newly made castle and slams the door behind her, right? She's shutting the world out and she can be inside that door safely. Okay, so what, what do the doors mean, right? So if you notice an author or a filmmaker, like a, like a screenwriter or um, a playwright, keeps bringing up the same object over and over again. And, and you, you understand that it's symbolic. You understand Elsa's on one side of the door, Anna's on the other side of the door. The door separates them, right? It's a symbol for separation, for being disconnected, even though they're sisters, right? We get that. But why would a screenwriter keep bringing up the idea of doors over and over and over and over again? That's where the idea of a motif comes into play. So the screenwriter wants us to see doors over and over and realize that they're separated and, and how sad it is, right? I think to me, I think the use of doors, the motif of doors in Frozen is to show us, you know, lead to the lesson. I mean, I think one of the lessons of Frozen is don't shut your loved ones out. Like, look how sad Elsa and Anna's lives have been because they've been closed off from each other. Elsa should have opened up the gates, opened up the doors long ago, right? But it took this big conflict between um, between her and her sister to finally open up. And finally, at the end of the movie, they could, you know, be loving toward one another and really truly be sisters, the ones they were, they were when they were children. So I think the lesson here um, through the use of doors, the motif of doors, is don't close yourself off. Nothing good's from closing the door in your life open up the door, let things in, let new experiences in, let new people in. It will help you develop relationships. You'll have a fuller life, right? So motif of doors teaches us that theme, that lesson. We also see it in Wally as well. Wally, um, he plays with a lighter, the idea of fire. It's not just fastening to him. Fire is also used to destroy things. Eve gets angry at some point in the movie. And she just starts blowing things up with her lasers. And so fire um, is able to destroy things here, but it's also fascinating. Um, it's not just not just the actual idea of fire, but they also use it later in the film during their dance. If you see the you know the way that they dance together is actually through a fire extinguisher. right If you remember this scene in the movie, okay, although it's not actual fire, it's still, you know, why would they have him use a fire extinguisher? It's obviously referencing fire. So why have this idea of fire come up over and over and over again uh, with a, a movie about these two robots? Well, if you think of fire and what fire represented for, hum for humans, when we discovered fire, it was able to give a civilization. We could heat our homes, we could cook food, we could survive long winters. It, it changed us as a being. And in this movie, we have humans have lost, lost that humanity, right? We just sit in these chairs and get driven around a spaceship. And actually, the two ro robots in the film here actually are more human than the actual humans are. And so what does fire represent in this? Um, maybe something to do with, again, the theme. Maybe this lesson of don't lose our humanity. You know, obviously this movie is a warning to us that we, as we become more and more obsessed with technology, we are losing some of our humanity. And so this fire, I think, is supposed to kind of be a spark. Right? Wally serves as a spark and kind of lights the fire under the humans to take back their humanity and kick out the robots that are controlling the spaceship and go back to Earth, right, to, to colonize Earth again and become human again, right? So... The fire, I think, serves as a spark. The two of these characters 
light the fire um, in, in the humans on the spaceship again, right? So that they actually feel like humans again. Well, maybe for the first time, actually. So again, just driving home the theme that we should not allow technology to take away our humanity. It's seen in literature too. We obviously have motifs in literature. Fire in the Hunger Games trilogy certainly comes up over and over again. Another example why fire is always surrounding Katniss, um, and we have we have this idea of you know she again serves as the spark for all the citizens in Pan Am that they were living this life. They were not. Um, they did not like the life they were living. They just went along with it and didn't like the Hunger Games either. But you know, she she was this example of this fireball that came in and changed everything. And again, pointing to the theme, don't allow the government to control you. Don't allow authority to come in and do things, um, make decisions, change policies that would be destructive, harmful, maybe fatal to your citizens. A motif doesn't have to be an object. It could be an idea. So the idea of a paradox if you remember from Fahrenheit 451, you might remember this creature, the mechanical hound who was both alive and not alive, slept but did not sleep, right? He was a paradox. He had two contradictory ideas within him. Um, the idea of, of Pinocchio, can if he says, my nose will grow and then his nose grows, does he, is he lying or not? It's paradox. So it doesn't have to be necessarily an object. It could be an idea or a concept like a paradox. And you actually will see that paradoxes are one of the motifs in Romeo and Juliet. So you're going to have these characters that feel very contradictory emotions and describe themselves in these contradictions. And it's like, how can someone be sad and happy at the same time when these are opposite emotions? Well, the idea of humans are paradoxes is going to come up a lot. Um, so you're going to see that motif throughout the play. I just want to say one thing about theme, since most motifs point to the theme um, or are used to illuminate the theme. But you remember the theme is a lesson or it's a message. It is not an idea, right? Love is an idea. Love is not a theme. You'd have to have a lesson attached to this. So it'd have to be something like love at first sight is not real. Right, so when we read Romeo and Juliet, make sure you know, you know, love is not a theme. It's got to be what is Shakespeare saying about love. Okay, so that is symbolism and motif and how motif uh, relates to the theme or you know, sometimes the mood, but mostly the theme. If you have any questions, please let me know.